Welcome, family. I hope you enjoy the following pre-recorded interview. Uh, this will be part one of at least a two-part series with Sister Tori, who is a former intern of Pastor Vladimir Savchuk's ministry, Hungry Generation. She's going to tell us the way that T.B. Joshua's ministry workings have actually influenced the church and the way they do business in their internship. So please grab your popcorn, grab your water, grab your coffee, grab your soda, and enjoy this first part of the, the interview process. And I assure you, part two will be very revealing. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and frenemies. I'm here today with Sister Tori, who has a very unique story she wanted to share with the body of Christ. Welcome, Tori. Hi, Rob. Thank you for allowing me to to share. Uh, thank you for the conversation that we that we've had, you know, previous to this, and actually had me like tearing up a little bit. I was trying to hold back just on your testimony, so I I appreciate that and you sharing that. So, um, yeah, I can't say that I'm like excited about this conversation, but it's necessary. And yeah. Well, well, you have a perspective that I, I share a little bit of, you know, I told you a little bit about my charismatic background or my the roots of the walk of my faith. But you have a testimony that is, is very much different because you come from an involvement with uh, Hungry Gen Church is that in the Demon Slayer camps. So you have a certain insight and you wanted to share that story. But first of all, if you would. Um, can you, you want to share a little bit about your Christian experience that led up to that point? Sure. Uh, just to share briefly as I possibly can. Um, I grew up in the Nazarene church and, um, you know, I was in the family that went to church every, every Sunday and a lot of Wednesdays, a lot of Sunday nights, all that stuff. Um, I was really involved in sports and, um, the involvement I did get into the church, they had a lot of like sports programs. So I played basketball and did all that and met other Christian friends that way. Um, but also just wasn't living for Jesus at all. And um, not to uh, bring anyone else into the situation. Uh, I won't be naming a lot of names, but I did have some abusive people in my life that were, you know, um, plugged into this church and that just made me, um, I think resent, uh, church people or the denomination. I think, um, there was more that went into it as well. I just, it, it seemed like this God that they were talking about wasn't real to them, you know, behind closed doors. So that was like a turnoff for me. Right. Um, but in my heart, I think I knew that God was real. And um, anyways, I had a come to Jesus moment when I was 18, um, 36 now, uh, but I was taking prescription pain uh, pills, Oxycontin, Vicodin, all that stuff and trading them with friends at school and getting high at school, not really thinking it was that severe. And then one day um, my pill stash got mixed in with my uh, gym socks and anyways, went through this whole withdrawal process, which I didn't think I was addicted. Um, so in my basement, I had a come to Jesus moment and I was like, God, if you're real, I need your help. Cause if I tell my family, like they're going to kill me, I don't have anybody else. So it was just like kind of me and God in that way. Um, and started kind of sorting out God for myself. Um, and I believe I did find him. And, um, I, I will say that in the Nazarene church, they don't really talk about the Holy spirit in the sense of him like moving in our lives to like help and strengthen and build a church. Um, but you know, he's definitely a name in, in the hymnal book. Uh, there's reference to him of course, but I f didn't uh, remember anyways, much teaching. I got to admit, maybe I was hung over half the Sundays in high school that I went to church. So that was, you know, my experience. I probably wasn't listening. Um, but when I did pray to God, I, uh, I said, um, taking the pastor's advice, he said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. And so, uh, and also like 
pray when you're at home. I remember him telling us this, pray when you're at home to ask God who needs your help and see what he'll speak to your heart. And he put an individual on my heart that was on my high school track team. And I didn't know her that well. She's a, you know, 4.0 athlete, uh, three sport athlete, nice kid, stuck to herself, you know, all this. So anyways, I went and um, I felt that she needed help financially. So I went, um, I went to the bank. I felt like I heard God tell me, cash your entire paycheck and give it to her. I cashed my check. I had a job, a part-time job. I cashed my check. I got the envelope and um, I just had this conversation with God, like in my heart, like, can I just keep $20 and go see a movie and then leave the hundred and some change? And I heard like in my heart and I like keep every penny in there. So I was like, okay. So I was excited. Again, didn't tell anybody. Went up to um, this friend on a Friday after practice so that I would not have to talk to her about it. Cause I thought this was so weird, you know, like, I don't even know what to say. Uh, so I went and I was like, Hey, this is from God. I don't want to talk about it. Gave her the envelope. The next Monday, she pretty much drug me into the locker room. I thought she was going to beat me up. You were talking about fighting earlier. Mm -hmm. I thought I was about to get beat up. And I saw a side of her I never thought I'd see. But she was like, who told you? She got real defensive. Um, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Basically, can you tell me? Um, I just felt like really this was from God. And that's all I know. And uh, she did share some details with her regards to her life that Basically, her family was on the verge of getting torn apart if she couldn't make it to work to help pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And her car had just broken down, and I didn't know that. She only told her best friend. Her best friend didn't talk to me. Uh, she ended up telling me the, the envelope I gave her was pretty much to the penny of what she needed for her car repair. Wow. And I didn't know exactly that she wasn't a believer. Like this was such a good kid. You would think this is a Christian, you know, like, but she, she didn't have any experience with the church, any experience knowing Jesus. And I didn't preach to her either. So she just took that, um, money. We all kept it to ourselves. Um, 10 years goes by. I don't hear from her. 10 years. She reaches out to me on Facebook and she was like, Hey, you remember that time you gave me the envelope? I said, yeah, I, I can't forget it. And um, because I was like shocked by God too, you know, I was shocked that he would speak to anybody in this way. And she said, well, we knew that you were believing in Jesus at this time. You didn't tell us about Jesus, but we knew that Jesus was real based on what had happened there. We went to our own church, figured out who Jesus was, got baptized, became Christians, got married, her and her best friend she's talking about, got married to Christian men and didn't, didn't look back. And I ran from God for like 10 years after that. That's a long story I won't get into. Um, so, but you, you were with God and you did something prompted, you believe, by the Holy Spirit, but that caused the crescendo of events that was part of leading her to Christ? Is yeah, that, and I didn't wow. find out for 10 years. Wow. And then yeah. she contacts you and that, okay, I think I'm going to hear the rest. Don't let me, forgive yeah. me for interrupting you. I just had to make sure it's. Yeah, uh, no, you got it. Pretty amazing. So a seed you planted 10 years earlier was part of, let's go on from there. <laughs> I yeah. Look. Yeah. Part, part of her, uh, just come coming to Jesus and, and another, and affecting, you know, her best friend, mm -hmm. I, they were like so tight all throughout high school. I knew that they didn't share any of their secrets. You know, they had a real good friendship and, uh, they were like, there's no way this girl knew that. I needed this right now in my life, you know, other than God. Yeah. And there is no way that I knew. Um, so yeah, there was, there was that. And um, there was God, you know, working on my heart and changing things. And then I was so like zealous for the Lord. I was going out evangelizing to my atheist friend, telling him about Jesus. Then we would get in a theological debate over really just, dumb things for lack of better terms. Like mm -hmm. could God, you know, micro of a burrito so hot that he'd burn his tongue. And I didn't know how to answer that. Cause I didn't know the difference between Peter and Paul back then. Mm -hmm. I was so not in my word. I was biblically illiterate. Um, and it, it 
this just sounds crazy, but it shook my faith after that experience. Of course, I didn't know she had come to Jesus yet, but I knew that we had like heard something from God. God did something there, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I became like an unwilling atheist for a while. And that just kind of set me off um, on a path of like depression and just other things. I went to college to play basketball. Um, I eventually tried to take my life. And when I did not die, again, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me that um, death wasn't for me at that time. And he's got more for me and that he's real. And I just believed again. And uh, it was a struggle since then because uh, so so this was um, about 2006. And I didn't feel safe going to my family for seeking, you know, biblical teaching on Jesus or like how to live a Christian life. I didn't, um, f for many reasons I won't get into right now, feel safe really um, discussing any of that with them. So I just kind of like also felt um, that there was some spiritual warfare and attack on my life that I couldn't put words to and I didn't have uh, the knowledge of the word or a faith community to help support me. So anyway, so I'm seeking that, um, seeking that out uh, from a distance for like 10 years and just running from God. I'm like, well, if I'm sinning, like the devil is not going to mess with me. So for 10 years, I went to college. I got good grades, but I like drank pretty much six nights a week. Um, yeah. Met my ex-husband in college. Um, met at a bar. We were at a Christian university. All this is happening at a Christian university. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot. A lot. So um, we get married. Um, his family is a, a wonderful family, I will say. Uh, they really got transformed by Jesus, like his immediately immediate family. They were living a really rough life and then met Jesus. And then w me and knowing them, I knew the sweetest people, the most like humble people, you know, but they were different before Christ. So um, anyways, interacting with them was like my connection with kind of any kind of faith conversation or friends or family in that area that I could confide with. So I kind of grew learning from anyways, my ex's mother, uh, in law, grandmother in law. Um, and just to make things even crazier, like, uh, God is so good. Okay. I'm just, I'm painting this picture of why would I get connected with the way I got connected. So mm -hmm. I'm in this uh, abusive family and I'm in this, I find myself in this abusive marriage. That's like, you know, behind closed doors and, uh, I'm keeping things a secret. And, you know, meanwhile, I'm not allowed to talk to my friends. I'm not allowed to talk to my family that I'm close with and only allowed to talk with family that he had made a good connection with. And of course that family, I didn't want to say anything bad about him too. So I'm in this and talking with his family and, and, you know, having some kind of faith expression there, they would invite me to church, but it was all Spanish speaking. So that was like, I don't know Spanish that well, so that didn't go well. Um, but I know they were praying for me and, and all this. Um, I ended up uh, separating from my ex. We decided to get back together um, as most domestic situations go. Um, and I thought that I would just give up my pursuit of God at the time because that was causing a rift in our marriage. And I gave up that. He was not okay with me going to church and things like that. So I gave it up for the sake of like saving the marriage. So I would get up early, you know, and I'd read my Bible in, in the living room and he'd get up accidentally or hear me or something, get up way earlier than normal. Anytime I was doing that, you know, um, and he would say something like, you're just doing this to throw it in my face, you know, and I'm clearly like trying to hide, hide it. And even in my car, I would change the uh, Christian radio station back to secular when I'd park it just in case he moved it because we had like a carport. Um, I would just do things to hide my faith for, for two years. So here I am like kind of in this prison of his life and his control and manipulation and then like trying to figure out my faith. Um, I found a local church that a friend had invited me to previously 
was doing an online podcast and then they stopped putting that out. And I was like, oh man, there goes my like teaching of the word and encouragement, you know? And so I was like Googling, you know, who should I listen to? That's a good Bible teacher, preacher. And you know, the top 10 are going to be Stephen Furtick and all the popular guys, right? That, that pull up all the guys that get, get the big views and everything. So this was like 20, um, 2017, 2018. Mm, okay. around, around about. Um, I started looking into also around that time Lester Summerall because he uh, had a TV station and a ministry in Indiana that my dad was the general manager at so it was just funny to me that I didn't know much about this guy um, from my dad's account other than he worked for him um, but I didn't know much about his ministry or anything like that so that sparked curiosity in me come to find out he was in a ministry uh i think it was very charismatic and also casting out demons and Mm. i was like wow the whole time and that's part of my story which may be another thing for another time but when i was 18 just to back up briefly uh, my nazarene pastors who never really talked about the holy spirit that i know about and again i was probably hung over it to, to their defense in Sunday service. Um, but I did know that I was in bondage at one point in my life and I went and I just knew I needed to get to the church and I knew that I needed to call on Jesus. And that's all I knew that in my soul that I needed to do. So I went to my church, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old, went to church, called out to Jesus, started singing, uh, with the worship and my jaw, like closed shut. And I couldn't open it. Everything got tight. Remember my like arms getting tight. And I have no idea what deliverance is outside of the exorcism movie. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I have no clue that this is an actual possible thing. You know, in my mind, it's all theatrics and fake. But all of a sudden, I'm here, and I don't know why this is like happening to me. My youth pastor noticed something was off. He took me uh, at the end of the service to my pastor's office. They began to lay hands on my head and pray for me. And then all of a sudden, all this darkness I had, all this torment I had was just gone. And I don't think it was anything crazy. I I, I know that at one point, everything went relaxed. Mm-hmm. My vision went blurry. I can't tell you if something spoke out of me. I can't tell you what happened in that room. I can just tell you that I was like, wow, I'm free. Mm-hmm. I'm not scared right now. <laughs> and... Anyways, that's when I took my freedom and, and ran in, into the world and kept, kept a comfortable distance from spirituality, we'll just say. So um, getting back into 2018, um, getting back into the church, looking into Lester Summerall, I think YouTube does a, this thing with their algorithm. And sure enough, uh, Hungry Jen pops up in, you know, in 2018. And Hungry Jen? Like, wow. What's Hungry Jen? Hungry Generation is Vladimir Sovchuk's church. Oh, okay. If you're familiar with the name. I knew that. And, I'm going to clarify that. Okay. For yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, so I, here I am. I'm looking at these young people uh, that are my age and at the time. And Lester Summerall has since passed on. And I was like, wow. Uh, I thought deliverance was out of the church completely and nobody cared if somebody was you know oppressed and nobody cared for these people and here are these young people being bold for jesus so i thought and caring for people you know that are in torment and um and one of the things i i will say that i regret when i was a young person is that i never went and had a conversation with my pastors after that i never went and asked them what should i do next you know they you know, I guess it could have come to me somehow and made recommendations. That conversation just never happened. Yes. So, um, anyways, uh, yeah. So I started listening online to to their services, um, listening to what they were teaching from the scripture. Um, and around the same time, also I wanted to get baptized. I won't get into that story right now. I got baptized in 2018. And I really felt uh, just God's deliverance over 
over my life and, and connection with him and just that um, moment. I can't totally explain it other than I had this boldness come upon me, which would be, you know, through the Holy Spirit to just tell my husband, like, hey, listen, I'm serving Jesus with my life. I'm not drinking anymore. Um, I'm not going to watch these movies anymore. I'm not going to go to these shows anymore. Um, and I need to go to church and I needed to be okay with that. And I think he like was shocked that I was like sticking up for myself and had this boldness. And surprisingly, he was like, okay. And I was like, I'm not going to drag you there. I'm not going to beat you over the head with the Bible. You know, like it's your decision if you want to go or not. And of course I prayed for him this whole time and found, uh, went back to the church that was doing that podcast in my area in Chicago there and met some really great Christians, uh, nice, kind people. Um, I think most of them, um, with really good intentions, I, I, I do believe. Um, but like, I don't know, even like ended up separating from my uh, ex-husband and my pastors took me and my, my associate pastors at the time. And they were very kind and loving and gracious and uh, the way I ended up there, it, I just felt like God was on it. And they they just showed Christ's love to me in that moment. That was just like, man, it brings me to, to tears. So maybe I won't talk about it now, but it's just so great. And then just every day to see them get up in the morning and like read their Bible and do devotional together as a couple at like six in the morning. And like, if, you know, and they were there for me, like, man, it was good. Um, so saw them up close and personal. Wow, this is real Christians. This is, this is great. They're serving their community. They don't care who sees them. They don't want it, anybody to see them. They don't go around telling people they're pastors. Like, this is a great witness, you know, to me in my life and just refreshing at that time in my life. Um, so I stayed with that church for a couple of years. Um, I ended up just being so on fire for Jesus and now in a healthy way and like learning the scriptures better, um, getting taught by my pastors, getting plugged into like prayer group and uh, Bible study there and stuff like that. And just learning more about the scripture and then sharing with my athletes at my university that I worked with um, about Jesus, watching those kids make a decision to come to Jesus and seeing people turn from, you know, Muslim, from atheist, from Jehovah's Witness to Christianity at the university. Mm -hmm. And um, so this whole time, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm just like, I know this is God. I know that the pastor that had taken me in, he had done campus ministry before. So he was helping a lot. Um, there was just a lot of community support. I think there's lots of local pastors that you know, did come in and were eager to come in and help. And this is a secular university. Um, so it was just like really cool to see God doing this. And yet I felt inadequate. I felt like I need, I, I have no business. Like I'm trying my best to lead these kids to Jesus, but I think that maybe I should go to school or something. Cause I don't want to, you know, mess these kids up spiritually. So anyways, in comes uh, looking into Hungry John's internship. Cause I'm okay. thinking, Yes, I'm thinking what I'm seeing online, this curated version of Hungry Gen is maybe what this community needs. Maybe they're, they're so broken and maybe they're demonized and maybe they need healing and that will bring them to Jesus. Because I had witnessed, you know, this miracle through this, I don't know if you call it a word of knowledge or a prompting of the God, whatever it is to give this money. And I, I know that happens all the time across denominations, stories like this, you know, God works like that. Um, but, you know, I thought maybe there's more because um, I did see these kids stop drinking. I did see these kids get hungry to read the word and like really repent. And then I saw them like backsliding and, you know, I'm like, man, maybe that's demons because that's what Hungry John's telling me. So, um, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I ended up uh, applying. Uh, I got accepted. It didn't work out to go 2020. Um, COVID happened. And then there was a lot of online activity. Um, I don't, um, I, I'm, I'm thinking about what to say or not to say here, but 
um, essentially I was, uh, plugged into alpha ministry at the time. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, but it is a free evangelism tool that talks about, um, the essentials of the Christian faith, starting with like, who is Jesus? Why did he die for us? And it's week by week. And it's meant to be, you know, um, these 20 minute videos and conversation over a meal. And so it's, it's very non-threatening to people that are questioning the faith or new to the faith for them to learn. Um, and so anyways, we were doing this. Um, I felt like this prompting from God again to, uh, show some friends that I'd met internationally, this alpha ministry tool. So I just felt really strongly. Um, it would have been 2019. It was like new year's Eve to like take this on online, show some people. So I did that um, with a group of friends and I was like, hey, this is a great tool I think you could use possibly uh, if you want to. And and we went through the course together. I was like, experience it first, test it out, see if, it, see if it's something you, you would wanna use. Um, and so anyways, COVID happened. Everything, you know, got, got shut down. There was an alpha ministry running between my pastor and myself at the church at that time. And um, he was like, Tori, I think we're going to have to shut down the alpha ministry because COVID and everything. And I was like, no, we can carry on line. Like I, we already ran, I know how to do stuff online now. Um, I've seen God answer prayer. I've seen, you know, people's lives get touched through it. Like you don't need to be exactly in person. And so um, anyways, we carried on online. So there was this whole like good connection and good things happening there at that church. Um, all of a sudden the Enneagram gets introduced into our church. It gets taught in one of our Sunday school classes. And I don't know anything about it. You know, I'm just like trusting these people that have really helped me. And I got nothing bad to say against them. Nothing bad at all. Um, and it, this uh, old, you know, former church member, this couple, they came in and taught a four week series on the Enneagram. And I remember the first thing they said was, hey, does anyone like think anything weird about what this Enneagram symbol is? And um, I had brought some of my college students to this course and they, they were like, so people think that this looks like a pentagram the satanic symbol, but they laughed it off and they're like, it's not satanic. That was it. That was it. That was all they said. Um, they shared about some Christian things and how it can be used and how you can figure out your sin through this. And um, I went to a couple of these. Some of my students went to this course. And then after that course, I wasn't super interested in it but everyone in the church kept talking about it. And then I kind of got interested in it. And I found out the more I learned about it or tried to use it or reflected on my life, the worse I felt. I felt like depressed. I felt like suddenly condemned. I felt like, man, and then I'm just like, this doesn't feel right here. Something is off. So, and again, I, I can't take credit because I do feel like that voice of God is like, look into this because this isn't good. So I looked into it. Sure enough, find out that the symbol was made in occultism. Um, I don't know if the viewers are super familiar with it, but it's witchcraft. And basically, um, this occultist speaker was going around saying how powerful it was and controlling people. And... Uh, it could be, yeah, is a tool of control of the occult. And he cautioned people, don't, uh, don't let this news get spread out because it's, it's, you know, powerful. So a Catholic priest in Chicago got, got a hold of this. He started teaching it. The guy that channeled, um, just briefly the story, he channeled a demon taking drugs, taking mescaline, channeled some demonic spirit, and he wrote the whole Enneagram. Well, he, they call it automatic writing. So he was channeling a demon and writing this Enneagram. And anyways, Catholic priest gets a hold of it, teaches on it. And this is out of the horse's mouth. This guy has this interview. He goes to this Catholic priest. He says, hey, that's my material. Don't use it. Uh, Catholic priest says, hey, we don't give credit in the Catholic church. I can use it if I want to. And the Catholic circles that mixed in with the 
Nazarene church and everything else, the Enneagram just circled around um, and made its rounds, I think, in Chicago very, very quickly. Um, and so it was popular, very popular in Chicago. In any ways, it had gotten to my church, and that's where I was confronted with it. And again, I felt God prompting me to go confront my my pastors about this. And I tried to do this in the most loving way possible and to sit down, you know, um, share with them my concern. Because at this time, I heard more people talking about the Enneagram in my church than Jesus. And yeah, I saw yeah. this flip of the switch. And I was like grieved over it, you know, I'm like, oh man, if they just know, they just like know the facts, they'll just, you know, who wouldn't want to just burn it and walk away from it, you know, after seeing that. And um, I, they basically, the lead pastors told me, we don't uh, really agree with you and uh, it's not that big of a deal and God can redeem anything, you know. And I, I had even the conversation with the sweetest people I know, I'm like, just like straight up, like, can God redeem a Ouija board? If I brought it to a prayer meeting, can you redeem that? Well, no, that's ridiculous. Okay, well, this is pretty much the same thing. Right. And um, anyways, they're like, we're not trying to control people. You know, we don't teach it anymore. Let, you know, put it to rest. But I'm like, everyone in your church is talking about it, though. Everyone loves it. So I eventually had to uh, remove myself from the church because, I mean, and they were like family to me. I was crying over this. People at the church were crying over this, like me leaving. Um, I still met with my pastors in tears, like, I got to go. I can't, you know, if you're not willing to stand up for what's right here, I can't stay here. Um, and they did kind of try to appease me with an article saying, well, if someone asked about the Enneagram, we'll give them this article. And it was very like, could go either way, Enneagram's good or bad, you know, article. So um, anyways, I left with still the intention to go to um, Hungry Gen internship and had already put in like two months notice at my job. I knew I was going out there. And I went out there, started a new job, didn't, um, someone at Hungry Gen dropped the ball, never returned my phone call, and I didn't get into the internship that first year. So I'm stuck out in Washington uh, with no internship to attend. Uh, I had a job, I had two jobs. Um, I decided that but you're in some Washington. other folks. The, the hungry, hungry generation is in Washington. What city in Washington? They're in, yeah, they're in Pasco, Washington. Okay, but um, and you're you're physically out there from Chicago. You're physically now transplanted yeah. to Washington. Okay. I left everything to go out there. Left I everything. left everything. Okay. I had even my landlord gave me this amazing deal. He was going to give me four acres of land in the South suburbs of Chicago for 200 grand. That's like a steal. That's a steal. So that was 2021. I said, Nope, I'm going out to this ministry school. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I go out there. I was before I, before I went, so I, I didn't really get into it, but I was plugged into online groups through hungry gen. Uh, for like a year before I moved out there, maybe even more than a year. Met a lot of great people uh, that that love Jesus, that were like just hungry to find people to like pray together with or like to read the scriptures with that just because of COVID and a million other reasons didn't have that community. Maybe they're in India and they're the only Christian in their town, you know, that kind of thing. So they found Hungry Gen through this. Um, a lot of well-meaning people I, I do believe, um, and we had a lot of great conversations about Jesus and a lot of great prayer time. And it just, we all developed this kind of like friendship and praying for one another. And, uh, the red flag started to come with the life group leader. And I'm not going to mention names right now. Uh, I think there will be a time for name dropping, but, um, this individual, he was leading this group of, uh, several, uh, I think there was several hundred people in there, maybe not all at once, but from all different countries. And this and, was online? 
this was online. So they're real. They're they're real adept at online organizing. Then. Um. May yeah yeah. The, so their their motto is like thousands locally, millions globally. Is they intend to to reach millions globally. Okay. Um. So this 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 particular group, um, this this particular gentleman, uh, we all grew to like appreciate his kind of like gentle spirit and giving us a chance to like express you know our faith and um, to to meet and he would sometimes get into the scripture. Sometimes we'd ask questions about the scripture and he would go into it. Um, but then he started writing his own book. And that's when things with him really, I think, started to change from my perception. Or maybe as I'm learning the scriptures better at this point, I'm realizing what he's saying is not really lining up with the scripture all that well. Um, and so that was kind of a, the starting of the red flag. And I continued to like stay in that group knowing I was going out there, knowing that I would really be going to church with this man. And I'm like, okay, he's a brother in Christ. He's flawed. I'm going to pray for this guy. And, uh, oh, by the way, during this time, um, you know, I'm invested. I'm following these hungry gen pastors and leaders on social media. And while I'm committed to going out there, I see on their social media, they're posting about the Enneagram. And I was so confused and so like distraught because I was like, how could this church that's so discerning about demons and spiritual things and they don't allow for anything demonic in anyone's life, you know, but they are like posting. It's like they all went to an Enneagram class together. I don't know what happened because like it's like same day. Everyone's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a five. I'm an eight. And it's like, oh, my goodness. So I reached out to that guy who was leading our uh, group. And I said, hey, this happened in my church. Uh, it's really bad. Here's the elevator speech on it. And he's like, yeah, that sounds bad. I'm going to talk to leadership. This shouldn't be going on in our church. So he talked to leadership, and I never saw a post about it or a conversation about it again after that. They didn't confront it. They didn't say anything against it. It just was, like, erased. Um, meanwhile, if we... I don't know if it's totally no, but I, I think the Enneagram is so widespread in so many churches. It's so sad to see, like, just, it's, it's like a cancer in the church. Yeah. And, um, that's another thing. But so I am like, okay, they were, um, discerning enough to take the evidence and say, you know, we're going to walk away from it and I respect that. And so I'm still going to go out there. Um, so this this guy he uh, trying to be cautious about what I what I say here, but he started to in our weekly meetings really start to talk about sex a lot, like mix it into the scripture and just it was like weird. Like some nights would be normal, like the old guys here, you know, but like who is this guy always talking about somehow bringing in sex or masturbation, like. Okay. In weird red ways. flag. Red flag. Red flags, right? Mm -hmm. And you try to bring it to, to scripture, but it was like weird. Um, so I went out um, around this time, would have been May of 21, to visit a friend out there who was helping this guy organize the Zooms. And she was like co host, like letting people in and out of the Zooms. And they were trying to, to troubleshoot on the Zoom something with the sound toggles and, and whatnot. So he was like screen sharing with her. This man's, he's married at this time, as far as we know, maybe having some marital distrust, but definitely still married. And she sees uh, his screen pops up with this uh, girl who was in our group and just really provocative kind of facial expressions and poses, nothing where she was like nude, but it was like, okay, something's going on. Here it was like a whole collage. Is how she described it, wow. and I was like, "Oh, wow, okay, I didn't see it." So, and you know, um, that church is very much, you know, don't gossip, don't, you know, don't don't slander, don't talk about anything, you know, um, even to the point of, 
if you have a problem with me, you are not allowed to talk to me about it. You have to go to the board of elders and then they'll. Who's, uh, who's me? There's a, if you have uh, a problem so, with Vlad, is that who you're saying? If, yeah. If you wanted to say something to Vlad, you're not allowed to speak to him? Correct. That's what uh, he said. Okay. So if you have a problem with the pastor, take that issue to the board of directors or board of trustees or something? Yeah, take it to the board. And then he said, and if it's, you know, worthwhile or if they decide, they'll talk to me about it. Uh, uh, he is really not open to correction or even questions then. That's that's very telling. That's a person with a very fragile ego, if you ask me. But yeah, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, no. Go um, ahead with the pictures. Yeah, so the pictures, and uh, she was crying, you know, when she told me this, and uh, she's like, I, I, um, I feel bad even telling you because I don't want to gossip, but she's like, there's something going on there, and it's not right. This person is in his 50s or maybe 60, I'm not sure, and this other girl, she's, you know, in a foreign country, in a third world country, and she's young. She's like in her 20s. Wow. And uh, she's like, this isn't right. Um, and lo and behold, I, I continued to think, okay, I can just pray for him. He listened to me once, you know, prayer worked and whatever. And I can just pray for this guy. And um, a couple months went by. He made the announcement that he was skin divorced. That um, also... He told us at one point he felt like a couple months after that, God gave him the okay to move on from his marriage or at least to get remarried. And then uh, a couple months after that, he announced to the group that uh, he was dating that girl from that other country, that young that woman. That was in the group, online group. In the online group. Wow, that's incredible. And then uh, they announced their engagement. So I was out in Washington at this time when they announced their engagement on, on the group. Um, I, it just confirmed everything, you know? Like, she, she did see that. She discerned correctly. Um, and this is a secret, you know? Because this guy was married and... This was this was in May of twenty one when she saw this. So I don't know who, who it matters to. They can take that information how they will. But the thing is, he said he had accountability in in the leadership there from Pastor Ilya. Ilya was his leader, and he didn't do anything without you know consulting him. And all this stuff was approved. A group was approved through him. Um, all, all these things come to find out his adult children, this man uh, were upset and were complaining to the church about this engagement. And the church had uh, made a rule at this time that all the online groups are going to be women with women, men with men and no more mixing, but they didn't address anything. They didn't publicly make any statement. Uh, they continued to have this man, lead as far as I know. Um, as far as he told us, there was no disconnection between him and Hungry Jen. And uh, we did hear some cl conflicting things that he was disconnected, that he was lying to us and he was kind of going rogue and still continuing on this group, even though he had gotten like a cease and desist. But it's conflicting because at the time, the man wrote the book and Pastor Vlad is promoting his book, helping him to promote his book. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was happening. So there's just so much like confusion and like, why don't they see this? So the, the other part of it too, is I, I never got into all of the profits they would bring. Um, I looked at them as a group of young guys that believed Jesus, believed the scripture at its word and were, operating through the Holy Spirit to do ministry. And I had assumed that when I got there in person, I would find a lot of individuals like I found online with like this 
kind, you know, like the fruit of the spirit, right. patience, loving kindness, all that stuff. I, I assumed when I got out there, that's what I would find even more so, right? Because they're meeting in person. Um, so when I got out there and uh, got to see how that situation was handled, got to see um, people, you know, up, up front, personal, interacting with these people, uh, meeting some people, going to different life groups there, it just seemed very cold and very clicky. And um, some people refer to it as the runway show because the women there like to dress in, you know, high heels, you know, very expensive purses, you know, $2,000 purses, you know, hair, makeup, you know, to the nines. And so there's like this pressure to look a certain way when you attend this church. And I'm kind of like, uh, I, I could care less about makeup in those things. And so I was just kind of doing me and I, maybe they looked at me like I was homeless or something. I'm not sure, but I, <laughs> sounds like the, it sounds like there was a class struggle between the bourgeois and the proletariat. Had a little, yes. We had a little, elite. and all those folks, yeah, all those folks would have the seat right up in front, you know, like James talks against and all the other people would be in the back. And even I had a friend that, drove in from Seattle once and witnessed a homeless guy come into the service and they stopped him at the door and turned him around. Wow. Wow. Yeah. He didn't fit the, um, he didn't fit the role, huh? They didn't want to catch no, him on and, camera. And it probably, it wasn't a deliverance Sunday maybe. So I don't know. Wow. Uh, but she did see that and, um, I, you know, th these are friends that I trust that I've, I've known for some years now. And, um, I, and I saw little things like this and just, um, man, more red flags. Uh, the other thing is with let's, I'm going to name these names. So passion Java has been there before I went out there. What? Uh, wait a Ed minute. Citronelli. Tori passion Java has been there. Passion Java has prophesied to all of the leadership. Wow. Ed Citronelli. Go ahead. I'm going to let you go. I'm sorry. Yeah. Tell Ed, Ed, Ed Citronella. Sorry. I, Lord, forgive me. His name is Citronelli. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, at some point, you get so gaslit. And you're like, is anyone else seeing this mm -hmm. problem? Is anyone else seeing these red flags? <laughs> I cannot be the only one. And you're not getting any clarity you're not getting any like they're just i don't know delusional i thought maybe they're just they don't know they haven't seen it they're delusional or under um a spell you know like in galatians like it is Paul's a delusion like, who, yeah who bewitched you and i thought i can pray for these people and they'll wake up so i was not like receiving from these prophets i was not you know, going to these things. And I wasn't even out there when Passion Java was out there, but this is online. Maybe they've taken it down, but they're known for not addressing anything when bad stuff does come to light. And they're known for keeping their videos up. So it's probably still up. Uh, but he went, he prophesied even a marriage to this couple that I ended up um, meeting one half of the couple. I will just say that and speaking uh, with them and hearing their story, but you, you can see in the video, he pretty much forced an engagement and sorry if my dog is, uh, he, she is not happy with the uh, people shoveling snow. Um, he forced uh, his hand on an engagement right there off of this prophecy and they were going through struggles as a couple. And one part of the couple was like, this is not good and this needs to end, but here, here, this prophet is telling us to get married. So, um, oh. mm -hmm. yeah, so there was a proposal there. Um, and there was a lot of false prophecies that never came to pass that really did hurt people's lives from that church. That still, um, maybe they, I know that couple has left that church for sure. Um, 
I don't know, but I've heard stories of just false hope, you know, basically. Yeah. And you can get somebody uh, who claims to be speaking for God, speak something like that prophecy that they're going to get married while inside, maybe possibly the Holy Spirit was bringing conviction on some one or both of the people's part that, Hey, this, this is the wrong man. We're, we're not a match. We're at two, we're, we're unequally yoked. We're, you know, at two different, you know, we're not right. This ain't it. Mm -hmm. So rather than following actually what God was doing, they follow the will of a man rather than following the will of God. That's the problem with these prophets. It's a notorious problem that you're missing the will of God because you're li not listening to God. You're listening to the, to the false prophet. Yeah. But I just wanted to interject. That's exactly that. right. That's exactly right. And I, it's like, um, we had discussed earlier the things that I had went through. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't have words for it. I didn't know that it was a thing, you know, I thought it was just my situation in my home that I was going, I'm the only one, you know, struggling with this until I got educated and went to domestic counseling and uh, Christian counseling and all, all of this. Like I had more language for what was happening there. And, um, and and I just want to articulate this you know, to yourself and also, hey, folks going to be watching this. As y'all watching this, part of the process of feeling and part, part of the process of healing, not feeling, but healing is having the language to express the things that have happened to you. That's why the reading of Psalms is so important for our prayers, because as we're reading the things that David is experiencing, it helps us to learn the proper process of prayer and to have that license to cry out to God in that way. Oh God, I'm feeling this and my enemies are doing that. You know, I mean, I learned so much about how to express things that I didn't even have words for. Okay. Remember I told you I, my life before Christ, I was, I was a fighter and I was a fighter because of all the stuff that was in me. But the healing comes when you get the language and the right person to express the things that are happening into you, in you. And it's God to whom you get the liberation and the freedom and the, uh, the peace comes from God, but almost without language, you can't even express those things. So the, the term gaslighting, the term narcissistic projection, love bombing, um, devaluing all these terms. And then you start learning them and you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm in a cult. <laughs> oh my gosh, there we we're we're a people allegedly of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is also called the spirit of truth and yet the truth is the last thing anybody wants to hear. You know, when Yeah. And and the worst thing about this cult type of behavior and I I understand there's some narcissists that don't realize they are they, they really think they're doing good. They really think everything they say is right and mm -hmm. righteous. And they even will, I think, put Jesus as the enabler, you know? They're, Jesus is the biggest enabler, and they, they spin the scriptures to that. My God's an enabling God kind of. Oh, a toxic dynamic. tolerance. A, to a toxic tolerance where you don't say anything. Oh, we don't say anything. Yeah. We don't talk about that. Almost like a... Uh, the the unwritten rule of toxic and dysfunctional families is we pretend like we're not like we are. <laughs> we pretend like mm -hmm. mama don't have a, a, a serious rage holism problem or we, we're pretending like our dad's not a drunk. You know, if he falls down at the annual family reunion, we just pick him up and put him in the car and act like he's not actually drunk, you know, and that's how you got people who are sick all coming into an environment. Um, and they haven't broken that uh, paradigm of dysfunction, you're never able to get healthy if you're never able to confront to confront issues. And yeah. I, I, th I think that's a lot of who these people prey upon, people who have, uh, who are young, who are biblically illiterate, who are looking for guidance, but in a lot of ways have not, they're, they're, not, con they're not confrontational, you know, yet mm -hmm. but you got someone like yourself if you don't mind me telling you tori 
you're you're waking up in the midst of it. You're thinking, "Am I crazy?" <laughs> no, you're not crazy. You're actually um, growing in maturity and in the knowledge of the Lord. You know, you're you're growing. They're not growing. Yeah. Amen. So go ahead. I'm Amen. sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. No. That's so good. Important to share too. And like I, I will say this. I have had tough conversations with friendships from people that I've made there that I, I really see them as victims. They will not tell you they're a victim. You know, I really, at this stage in the game, see a lot of them as victims and even had a tough conversation just recently of a friend that asked to do ministry with me. And I said, man, this friendship is really hard to carry on. And I have to tell you, no, because, you know, the proverb says an, an honest response from a friend, you know, it's better than a kiss from an enemy. And I was like, it may hurt to hear this, but I don't even know if we can continue friendship and I would not do any ministry with you because you're a victim and you don't see it. And we've had several biblical conversations about what's happening there. And that might be, you know, something I can get into more later, but it's hard. And the problem in this movement um, that is part of that control and manipulation this was a big key for me to getting freedom and seeing more clearly and being more bold because this is the biggest thing that they use. This is the linchpin of this whole movement is touch not the Lord's anointed, do my prophets no harm. Whoa. <laughs> that, and that is in the Old Testament. That is in reference to God's prophets who are carrying the word of the Lord so that they would not be killed as they move from town to town. This does not apply to the new covenant. You know, the whole old Testament points to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We've got Jesus. We got the new covenant. We got Emmanuel, right? We've always, we've always had Jesus, but now he's God with us. Mm -hmm. And we don't, um, that doesn't apply. There's false prophets. Jesus said many, there will be many in the end times. There will be many false teachers, false prophets, you read the book of Jude, what does it talk about? It's a warning to the church. There's so many warnings, I think, in most every book of the New Testament about false prophets, false teachers. And it's like, of course, they're not going to go over these scriptures or they're going to turn it around and say that it's people walking into their church and sitting in their pews. Like they'll call me the false prophet in the wolf. I'm the wolf, the person that's sitting in the pew. I'm the wolf. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, so they'll say, touch not the Lord's anointed, and they will tell you that they're scared. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Benny Hinn and Passion Java. They have oh. a video together. Mm -hmm. They On this video, they are uh, talking about, Benny is like, there was this time where these guys were speaking against me, speaking against my ministry. And in a meeting of hundreds of people, I, he's like, I felt God on this. And I told them, uh, God is going to strike you down tomorrow if you don't repent. And I think when you're in that, your mind gets to this place of, oh my gosh, you know, stress. Like, this is a man of God speaking to me. I'm going to die. And I think that man stressed himself out. He ended up having a heart attack the next day and dying. And of course, in this video, Passion Java is like, wow, 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 you know, and he uses that as part of his doctrine. So that one instance justifies their always using that. Well, that level always. of mind control is possible. I mean, have you ever known somebody who when they come in the room, there's always turmoil, maybe a boss or a family member who like when they come in the room, the, everything can be peaceful but the room turns upside down on their arrival because they're going to begin pointing fingers at everyone. And they're going to begin saying, why didn't you do this? And I found this. And, and, and so maybe someone, a parent, <laughs> it could be a parent, it could be a parent and they're narcissistic, but you're having a great day at home alone with your brothers, sisters. And then, you know, it's getting time for dad or it's getting time. Cause look, let's just be honest dysfunction toxic comes from everywhere and mm -hmm. you just read the arrival 
home of a certain parent, or you dread the, the day that you have to have uh, do overtime on Saturday and you're going to have that certain supervisor is going to be there on Saturday, you know? So I'm telling you, there is a physiological effect to the power that these people have, you know, it's not the power yeah. of God, but I mean, if, if certain people just their presence can make your pulse go up, it can make your blood pressure go up and can it be taken to the effect where his words terrified or stressed a person out to death? If you want to talk about cursing God's people, that's a man who just cursed God's people, but that's not of God. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's almost, the, it's, it's almost more the description of what witchcraft is. Yeah. So you see Passion Java idolizing Benny Hinn, and especially yep. in this statement. Like, yep. he was like, wow, say that again. You know, like... Because he would love to have the kind of power that could that could curse to that could kill someone. He he wants yeah. his enemies killed, which is the diametrical opposite of what a man or woman of faith is not supposed to want their enemies wish their enemies dead. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Look yeah. at what and Christ did for our life. Christ, the the good shepherd, lays down his life for the sheep. Amen. <laughs> You know, um, th he didn't kill di disagreeable sheep. Jesus did not kill disagreeable sheep. You know, while we were yet enemies, we were all yes. enemies. Christ died for us. And then you got pastors who claim to know Christ who want to kill disagreeable sheep or curse him. Yeah. That's backwards. That's antichrist. You're talking about a different Christ. Ooh, exactly. And if we get into this, I don't know how we're doing on time. Um, Let's see how we're doing here. Let me look at my timer. We're at one hour right now, sis. <laughs> do you want to shut this one down and do a part two? Yeah, we can do a part two. We can pick up uh, where we left off, but uh, there is, yeah, this is just like laying the foundation for speaking up. And I think now is the time to speak up um in light of the bbc documentary that came out about tb joshua and hungry jen's involvement um and just how brave those people are coming forward men and women i think it was over 30 people that came forward with their testimonies on the abuses horrible abuses yeah. that these people went through tears and everything and you have this whole movement looking to this man as a prophet speaking out of the mouth of God, touch not the Lord's anointed prophet. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets really, it gets really hairy from here. Um, so it's probably a good, good stopping point to go to, but I commend those people that have come forward I thank them for their courage and their bravery to come yeah. forward. And even the things that I've come forward with in my measly little five followers on online or whatever, like I have gotten, you know, backlash. I've gotten threats, gotten threats in person, in private, in my DMs. Um, and they're going through it, you know, loads worse right now. They're really going through it. This is no benefit to come forward. And when you're in a narcissistic relationship, there's no benefit to call them out. There's no benefit to you. Uh, no. You're going to end up dead or worse. And um, in my situation, uh, my life was threatened by my ex-husband. And he, he, by the grace of God, has not ended my life. But he has really destroyed my family through it, my family relationships through it, and continues to do so. So that's like, very difficult. To, to speak the truth. It's yeah. very difficult, um, but it's necessary. And I thank you anyways for giving me the space to, to share this. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and just, I hope that just so, just so you know, and just to put out there, I've, you're, 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 have, you've had contact with hungry Jen, but I've also had people who have contact with almost every one of these ministries in the modern demon slayer movement who has information to tell and they're afraid to come forward. Okay. So uh, 
especially to know, you know, the one church members who want to come forward with the way that church is operated and the, the view of leadership as untouchable and uncorrectable, uh, unanswerable for anything. And it's very important to point this out. Maybe more will come forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, and now, now, now's the time because, you know, thanks to the BBC who, who, by the way, did this documentary when TV Joshua was still alive. And then the grossest part on all this is how many people are saying nothing, which is hungry gen's default mode to say nothing. Um, or they're defending this man and calling these victims liars. And the evidence is so clear. Yeah. And it's really disgusting. And But at the same time as it's disgusting, they're exposing themselves. You know, mm-hmm. they're exposing themselves. And it hurts, you know. Um, but I do have hope that, you know, truth, you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. And whoever's willing and- to listen will get that freedom. That's real deliverance right there, sister. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, God bless you. I'm going to shut this one down, but I'm not going to hang up on you. So thanks for hanging out for this session. And we're going to do a part two. We're just exploring this conversationally. Y'all watched me. I'm just a listening ear to a sister who's had real life, real time experience, interaction with uh, Hungry Jen. And the um, I call it the M.O. because every every individual and every organization has an M.O. or a modus operandi, how they do business and how they do business. It sounds like is a major contradiction to how Christ would have us do business. Amen, Tori. Amen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll catch you in episode number two. Grace, peace and love in Jesus name. Amen.